there was, I think always in, in the history of aviation, an interest in human-powered flight because uh, Leonardo da Vinci drew a man flying a machine and you think of a bird and can man do that. Then when the Wright brothers began engine-powered flight, people realized that human-powered flight really was pretty impractical. Human puts out sort of a third of a horsepower, but here engines put out 10 horsepower, 100 horsepower, 1,000 horsepower, and eventually uh, airplanes achieved all sorts of great goals with those engines, so human-powered flight just got forgotten. But as an old goal, it still lingered in people's minds, and there were some tiny prizes put up for it in the 30s, which weren't won. And then a group in England uh, called the Man-Powered Aircraft Group uh, assembled itself and began working on it on a very low-level hobby basis, and one of the stalwarts in that group was the head of one of the companies that the British industrialist Henry Kramer had, and he would ask this person, how was that program coming? And one time after one of the divisions of his empire had been sold and he was having a three martini lunch, uh, he asked how it was going, it wasn't going very well, well, uh, how can you get it moving? Well, maybe a prize would be a good idea. Well, I'll put up a prize, and so it was just done like that. But Kramer was pretty farsighted and was an enthusiast for physical uh, conditioning, and, but I don't think it had huge deliberation in it. But it really was a very important event to take place, put up a prize, which eventually became a very significant prize, because all of us have known power, big power, available cheaply our whole lives, just you, you always have 100 horsepower, 200 horsepower car, and all the heat you need in your house, and so on. And it's hard to realize that just 200 years ago, all our ancestors were getting by on, uh, for transportation, on biological power. They would walk, run, uh, whatever, uh, use a horse, and and then occasionally you'd use windmills for some things and, and water power and there'd be sailboats. But basically we got by on those puny powers and now we can't even conceive of how we would do it. So here is this <coughs> Britisher who in effect said, go back to the power that we were using and but use modern technology and fly, fly on a third of a horse power. And that was an amazing challenge of uh, I think of, of great value as we find it's more important to think of uh, biology and nature at the same time we're thinking about technology and also think about how little energy and materials we can get by with. So this, this challenge was not just uh, another ordinary one. I think it had great value and we can see that challenge uh, produced our, and the significant prize produced our Gossamer Condor, uh, without which there would not have been the Gossamer Albatross, without which there would not have been the Solar Challenger or the, let's say, the Pterodactyl. And without all of these, there wouldn't have been the Sun Racer, uh, solar-powered car that won the race across Australia in 87. And without that, uh, there would not have been the impact battery-powered car that now is going into mass production. So uh, as you look back in roots, you realize that was a pretty important lunch that took place uh, many, many decades ago. What was really fascinating about human-powered flight was there was a 50,000-pound prize for achieving it. And that's the sole reason that I got into it. Uh, subsequent project on human-powered flight was the Gossamer Albatross flight across the channel. Then it was 100,000 pounds, and that was the glorious motive for doing that project. But after that, the programs were done for somewhat more altruistic reasons. And in a rather unplanned way, one thing led to another. In, in, we couldn't have anticipated uh, what happened, and they all have 
tended to feature uh, lightweight, uh, pushing the frontier, low power, electric power, solar power, uh, human power. So there's a lot of uh, random influence in it, but it all began because of the prize money. I had guaranteed a relative's loan at the bank for roughly $100,000 for him to start a company which didn't succeed and he couldn't pay the money back and as guarantor of the note I had to pay or I had I was obligated to pay the money back and because of some peculiar circumstances where I thought I had some liquid assets around they had evaporated uh, while all this was going on so I was stuck with the debt which was rather annoying wasn't anything I could do about it and uh, I didn't have any special plans on what to do because I couldn't figure out how to handle it, but I was in going on this vacation trip in the summer of 1976, uh, having time to just daydream, let the mind dawdle around at what it wanted to think about, nibbling away on little old memories and new thoughts and making connections that I otherwise would not have made. I did recall with no special emphasis this 50,000 pound prize that Henry Kramer had put up 17 years earlier. And then one day I happened to notice that at that time the pound was worth just $2. And suddenly this great light bulb just glowed over my head. And the prize was $100,000 and my debt was $100,000. There just may be some interesting connection between these two. So my interest in human powered flight suddenly zoomed up to high level and I fussed away at it and eventually it worked. First of all, just uh, looking at that, I realized, looking back, that for me, right at that time, uh, with my particular skills, strengths, and weaknesses, uh, which all helped with it, it was almost as though the Kramer Prize was designed for me at that stage. There wasn't anybody in the, the world as, as well situated to handle it. Uh, with knowledge of aerodynamics, but uh, no knowledge of structures, so I could more flexibly deal with new methods there. Living in Southern California, where all the aerospace technologies are around, and if you need some tubing, you just go buy it. If you need it chemically milled, you take it someplace else, they chemically mill it. You couldn't do this in the uh, middle of some other state in the United States or some other country, and where you can get a good airport and an empty hangar if you hunt around for it and the weather is gentle and so on. Just so many things, uh, it, it almost seemed like this was the perfect spot to win that prize. Every time I came up with an idea, it turned out it was just the same as the teams in England, rather elegant groups that made rather sophisticated aircraft that didn't come close to winning the prize. It was the same way that they had been doing it and that demonstrated that those approaches really were not very good. Plus I couldn't aspire to make such complex uh, elegant aircraft as they, has ma they had made. In this case what I was doing was a uh, just a fun little scientific hobby. I realized on a vacation trip that you could figure out the flight speed and the turning radius of birds flying around in circles, just soaring uh, in circles like you see a hawk do a turkey vulture, by noting the time to do a turn and estimating the bank angle uh, at which the bird was operating. From those two numbers you can immediately calculate the flight speed and turning radius and you can do it with essentially no tools, just your wristwatch and estimating the, the bank angle. And you have to write a formula and use a little calculator for it. So uh, we were doing this on this vacation trip and comparing the black vulture with the turkey vulture, which uh, flies slower in smaller thermals and can take off earlier in the day when the thermals are smaller. And you begin being more interested in how one bird compares with the other. And then I found myself uh, thinking about how does this compare with a hang glider? Uh, can it fly the same turning radius? What about sailplane? How much power does each take? What about the power per pound? I was doing the scaling laws for all these different flight 
devices, natural and artificial. In my mind, the scaling laws are pretty simple. And while working on that, I thought back about human-powered flight and realized, well, yes, there was a very simple, straightforward way of doing it, which is merely that you can take any airplane conceptually, keep the size the same, I mean, keep the weight the same, but let the size just get bigger and bigger and bigger in all dimensions, and the power goes down. And conceptually, you can make it big enough so it can get by on the tiny power that a person puts out. And you work out the numbers, you realize if you take a hang glider, sort of 30-foot span, and keep the weight the same, sort of 50 pounds, 70 pounds, something like that, uh, and swell it up to a 90-foot span, and the cord increase also, the power goes down to one-third of what it was, and that brings it down to about 0.4 horsepower, which a person, a good athlete, can put out for some number of minutes. So you didn't need an elegant sailplane-like aircraft. You could have an ugly, dirty-looking hang glider type plane, quick to build, as long as you made it giant without the weight going up. So that was the basic idea. There's one other idea that was essential, which was how do you make something that big without the weight going up? But there, the, the gimmick was that you did not need a structural safety margin that you need in a regular hang glider, which is going to fly at high altitude. So if it breaks, somebody's going to get hurt. This was only going to fly at 10 feet altitude, 10 miles an hour. If it broke, who cared? It would just Nobody would get hurt at all. So you could have it just on the very edge of breaking, no safety margin at all. Instead of cables, you use thin piano wire uh, as a structural element. And so that, uh, with that idea and the basic idea of uh, large and light, uh, the problem was solved. And it, I knew there'd be a bunch of grunt work engineering to actually win the prize, but uh, the idea that assured that the prize could be won was then in possession. But it had to be large and light uh, larger and lighter than any plane had been made up till then of, of small light planes. It was a, ended up 96 foot span and 55 pounds, uh, occasionally up to 70 pounds, uh, which is pretty light, unprecedented in uh, the way people have made airplanes. Well, some airliners, I forget the DC 9, uh, 727, they're around that wingspan, but then the 747 would be sort of 150 foot span, I think. So it's smaller than a jumbo jet, but it's actually larger than some of the smaller transports that you see in the sky, but a lot lighter <laughs> by a good bit. <laughs> and a lot slower and doesn't carry many people and the people it carries have to work pretty hard. Oh yeah, every task I get involved in is always a lot bigger than I expect because I naively think we just do this and that and that'll work uh, and it never happens and people who work with me sometimes double the time estimates, other times they increase them by a factor of 10 and they're usually, the latter are usually more correct. But we were entering such a new realm of flight, never before really investigated, that you just couldn't predict what was going on. Looking back, we did it just right, as quickly as we could after some early tests and models and a bunch of calculations. We built a first version without even putting a propeller on it and just to see if it would fly and about how much power it took to keep it up, then added the propeller and, and did a lot of tests with it. And it was pretty crummy, very crude, uh, but uh, and not efficient. Uh, and bad stability and control and so on, but because we could rush it out and do tests with it, we began getting good insights about all its difficulties and then we're able to do uh, a lot of work to come up with the more elegant devices that followed. What we really went back to is what birds have been doing for a hundred million years, so who thought of it first is a uh, question. One of the blind alleys that we went up uh, in this development of the Gossamer Condor was, I was picturing that because the flight was so slow and the turns were fairly large, that you could just have a, uh, a wing that always had the same shape and you could gent gently get around the turn. But uh, when we were having huge problems with the turn and with other aspects of stability and control, I finally 
sat down and really did some calculations and realized the huge uh, increase of angle of attack you get in the uh, one wing versus the other wing and that it was necessary in order to maintain uh, lift, well, a big change of speed, I should say, uh, in order to maintain lift, you have to change the angle of the wing. You just plain have to twist the wing, and when you finally began twisting the wing, it suddenly began working pretty well. But there were a, a lot of other problems to the stability and control part that the wing, the, the need to wing twist was important, and I should have figured that out ahead of time and incorporated it right with the very first vehicle. But because uh, I have mental blinders like everybody else. I went off on what I thought was a simpler approach. I tried to do everything on this project as simply as possible, assuming that the simple answer would work. You know it wouldn't always, but that saves you a lot of time, so when you get to a troublesome thing, you can then spend some time with it. So we figured that one out, and then by some ingenious tests with a little model that only took an hour to build, uh, pushed around in a swimming pool, just a couple of slabs of balsa wood, we got some final uh, insights about what some computer programs were trying to tell us. Uh, the computer programs, rather elegant technology, were correct, but they didn't give you any insight. This swimming pool event did give us the insight, and we figured out how to complete all the stability and control problems and came up with a final version, and it worked. We were getting longer flights each day as we would continue cleaning up, tightening the mylar, getting things so they don't ripple as much, and uh, also getting the pilot more accustomed to it. And finally, he did a flight that almost completed the one-mile figure eight. You have to do a figure eight flight around pylons half a mile apart. And at the very beginning, you have to go over a 10-foot marker, and at the very end, over a 10-foot marker. So you can't have a, a ground effect machine that's only a millimeter off the ground. And he had done a flight of almost eight minutes, but not been able to get up over that last hurdle. So it was pretty obvious that the next time, if the weather was right, it was going to work. And then we got forecast of uh, appropriate weather, and we were able to get the obser official observer out, and all got out there. I don't remember whether we went out early that morning, very early, because it's a two and a half hour drive from here to get to the airport or whether we went out the previous night. I suspect it was the previous night and got everything together and uh, the flight succeeded on that occasion, just, just barely. After that prize was won, this prize of Henry Kramer's that had stood for 18 years no longer existed and so he didn't have a prize out and about Four f months later or so, he put up the new prize for a flight across the English Channel, which is a 22-mile flight across a dangerous body of water. And I, I think he thought it was probably going to take another 18 years for somebody to do that because it was so much longer than this first one-mile flight. But we realized that if you just cleaned up the Condor and made a plane that was more elegantly fashioned, more accurately contoured wing, many more ribs, uh, better uh, f foam to help contour the wing and so on. Fo focus on structure, didn't pay any new attention to aerodynamics because that had all been solved in the previous one. This new plane, which we'd call a Gossamer Albatross, could get by on maybe a third less power and a bicyclist can put out a, a little less power for a much longer period of time and so Brian Allen, our pilot, should be able to fly this new plane for literally hours if we got it all properly cleaned up, but now we focused, so we built it, we focused on, and I guess it was built by mid-spring of the next year, and we were using carbon fiber uh, composite tubes instead of aluminum and lots of very lightweight foam ribs and so on, uh, a lot of sort of space age uh, materials to make a better vehicle, and it flew right from the beginning doing just what it should, but uh, we had usual accidents and control problems, so on, but it, it did, it was obvious this was capable of winning the prize. 
but it was also becoming obvious that this was going to be a big project to build backup airplanes, to test them, get them to break in control circumstances rather than out over the channel, and get them all to England somehow, and wait around for weather and do more tests there, and, and rent boats, and so on. So we sought sponsorship in the DuPont Company, whose materials we were using uh, a good bit of, uh, agreed to sponsor it, and the project proceeded. Well, the event was uh, the most, perhaps the most, one of the most exciting things certainly that I've ever lived through or that any of the people involved with it would live through, but it doesn't mean it's something we'd want to go do again. The, maybe the pilot was tired, but the hundred other people who were all in boats going along with him trying to use psychokinesis to uh, lift him up mentally uh, were certainly exhausted by the time the thing was over. The, really the big pressure uh, was organizing this thing. You had to predict the previous day by three o'clock whether you're going to do a flight the next day and none of the weather forecasts you got ever agreed or ever agreed with the weather that subsequently materialized because it's a very difficult area to get good weather forecasts and yet uh, I'd have to uh, I'd actually have to ride over on a bike. I had a broken foot at the time and a cast on and I had to ride over from the airport to a pay phone and uh, find the weather forecasts and then uh, turn on or not turn on the whole project. And once the project was turned on, which it was for this day, uh, about a hundred people, journalist types, were converging from all over Europe and, uh, and then all the team, the DuPont people. It was, it was it's about like operating D-Day out of a pay telephone booth, and it, it had pressure, and the usual pressure, we were running out of money, and the weather wasn't right, et cetera. But finally, we thought, okay, let's try it. Uh, there's really zero chance of it working right the first time, and the first plane was considered sort of a sacrificial plane. We didn't know what was going to go wrong. We knew something would, of the hundred things that could go wrong would go wrong but then assembled the plane on a thing called the Warren, where the, one of the early tunnels was starting to be dug from England to France, but it's kind of an acre of concrete just in the right place for us. Well, it was off in the air and everything was going fine. Uh, There's radio communication both ways. I was in the boat uh, about 1,500 feet in front of the plane doing navigating with radar and, and figuring out where we were, where all the boats in the channel were, where they were going to be by the time we reached them because you couldn't have the, you couldn't cross in front of one of the big tank, super tankers in case you crash, they, they can't turn and you can't be within two miles behind them because they leave turbulence in the air. That would be too much for the plane. So maybe 20 minutes ahead of time, you have to know where you're going to be, where they're going to be, and make little variations of the course. And the whole thing was quite a strain. And Brian, uh, we only felt that he could keep the plane up for two hours. Prior tests had shown his stamina, the amount of plane, the power of the plane required. So we only gave him enough water to avoid dehydration for two hours. Any extra water would have added weight, and he couldn't have lasted the two hours even. But unfortunately, a headwind cropped up that meant that after two hours he was still nowhere near the French coast. He still had many miles to go and he was all out of water and, and the, the increased wind also made more turbulence which in the, in the air which made the power required a little bit higher for the plane. And finally, he just had to give up and signaled for a tow. Uh, so a little rubber boat with several people in it uh, went around under him and with a fishing pole was trying to snag a line onto a little hook, uh, a little uh, ring on the plane and provide a tow to tow it either one coast or the other. But during the maneuver he had to move up higher and he found that the air was a lot calmer up there in the stable air. The turbulence was damped out and it took a little less power up high uh, 
usually takes a little less power down low. There's a ground effect that helps you. But here there was turbulence that was bad down low. We got up high, took a little less power, and so he decided, uh, even though they were trying to catch the plane all the time, he kept dodging finally and, and finally said uh, the radio wasn't working then, but he signaled that he didn't want to be hooked up, and he decided to continue for five more minutes and give it a try. And then the five minutes became 10, and became 15, became 20, but some of the time he was down low, and he, for a while he was down really just six inches above the water, and there were changing winds, and uh, somehow he struggled along as his left leg cramped from the dehydration. He'd pedal mostly with his right, and the right leg would cramp, and he'd pedal mostly with his left. And Towards the end, both legs were cramped, but he somehow just got that last little bit, and there was extra turbulence that was almost beyond the capability of the plane to, to handle its controls at just that last bit, 50 meters offshore, but finally made it, and just almost a three-hour flight beyond all odds, just impossible for human stamina to have kept going that long, but he did. And if it had been high tide, I think he wouldn't have made it because it would have had to go an extra 100 meters to reach the shore. It was that close. He had worked for the last several months before the flight with a full-time exercise physiologist, a professor, uh, Joe Mastropalo, who uh, helped him train to build up his stamina. He was a good bicyclist, but hadn't been doing Olympic training, but, but uh, worked at it very hard. And Master Palo, I think, gave him the real spirit, the attitude that you just don't quit. It doesn't matter how impossible, how painful. Uh, if you're conscious, you're still pedaling. And somehow this sunk into Brian. And what he did then was just so beyond human, reasonable human stamina. I've never seen anything else like it. So another day of great relief. This pressure was over. We were pretty sure it would succeed sometime, but to have it work the first time uh, was remarkable. Those are the lightest. You can't get any non-toy wheels that are down in the two ounce, three ounce category. And it's about five inch diameter because uh, it was only going to be used once in the flight for a few seconds on takeoff. The rest of the time it was just dead weight. So you, want to, you don't want it good, reliable. You want it just strong enough to handle that. And we found that from little toy trucks, uh, you could find such wheels. So that's what we used. Because right. the idea, you know, this whole project and the previous Gossamer Albatross project, the only goal was to win the prize. And it wasn't to have fun. It wasn't to make a museum piece. It wasn't to make something that was ever going to fly a second flight. It was just to win the prize. On the Gossamer Condor, we never even drew plans until after the prize was won, because you didn't need plans with the way we were doing it. We did use computers for some things, but there are no plans drawn. And it's rare that you have a project that is so simple, one goal, and you can focus on that. People tend to formalize things more, and they do more drawings, and they make parts better than they need to be. We knew exactly what we were trying to do, and we compromised right to the very limit on every little part. So if a toy wheel worked, great. The most exciting or heartwarming event that took place was when I suddenly realized, or just suddenly dawned on me, there was a surefire approach that would permit one to win the Kramer Prize, achieve the sustained, controlled, human-powered flight that the prize represented. And winning the prize was nice, but that was just inevitable. Once one had the idea, that was the important part. So that was the sort of aha moment, and many wonderful things have evolved as a consequence of that. So that was a pretty critical moment. Life would have been okay still if that hadn't happened, but th that certainly launched me on a bunch of other areas, which my background did uh, prepare me for, but I didn't know what they were. He really wanted a Britisher to win the first 
prize, and there was a British team sort of working towards the second prize, uh, which I think he had thought maybe that prize would be just right for the British team. The British team didn't come close, and I think they were annoyed that an American won the next one, and also annoyed that it looked like this was a big corporation project, DuPont sponsoring, and actually DuPont didn't sponsor the development of the plane, and they said, just do the project your own way, they just take care of the major expenses, but uh, I think that it would have preferred a Britisher to win it. There was a, another Kramer Prize to duplicate our first Gossamer Condor flight, prize of about 10,000 pounds, around $15,000 then, and a couple of high school kids could have just copied the Condor and built it with $500 of parts and won that prize in England, and nobody did, and it's kind of hard to figure out. But people in England were most cooperative. We just got help throughout. Uh, people didn't seem to care that we were Yanks from overseas. Uh, as soon as we landed, the field that we, and hangar that we'd been tending to use fell through, and in, in just that day, we were able to get the uh, Manston RAF base to provide a hangar, which they cleaned out. It was just big enough for us to, to set up operations in, and l just a lot of people cooperated like that. They, they were delighted to see the prize won. And that was one of the reasons why we were rather delighted to have the plane go to the Science Museum in London after uh, a while. I gave it to the Smithsonian here, but then they loaned it to the Science Museum in London. It was after the Gossamer Albatross project, which worked so well for DuPont, they got huge publicity value out of it, uh, you know, advanced technology and the DuPont spirit and uh, it's a nice place to work, and they got more employees, and, and it was just, it was a grabber on television, because a very exciting thing, there was a good movie done on it that, that showed some of the excitement. So then when we went to them with the idea of solar-powered airplane, they said yes. It was very surprising they said yes at first on that very peculiar human-powered airplane project. And they said no a couple of times before they finally agreed, but now on the solar airplane they said yes, because they figured if I said it could be done, then it could be done, and we got their support, and we were doing it from our standpoint. There was no prize. They were going to handle the expenses, but no prize, but the prize was somehow getting the man on the street, the government uh, administrator and so on, just to have a little better appreciation for what solar cells can mean and that they're an important part of our energy future and, and, and will be one of those things that helps wean us away from this over addiction to foreign oil, which we now have. So the, flying an airplane on solar power really doesn't make sense. You can do it as a stunt or as a symbol, but you're not going to have solar powered airliners. That Solar Challenger was very elegantly designed, developed airplane. And 48 foot span weighed about 100 pounds of, of airplane structure and about 100 pounds of solar cells and motor and wiring and so on. Uh, so a little over 200 pounds total. The only way to get it to fly properly was to use a very lightweight pilot. We used either a 95 pound woman or 125 pound man. To, that's the easiest way to save weight. It would just barely take off uh, on the sun power that you get down near the ground where there's usually a little haze, and it'd be about 1,500 watts of energy, uh, solar energy that you'd get to make it take off and it would kind of stagger into the air at about 19 miles an hour. But then the higher it got, the, the stronger the sunshine is by a little bit. The cooler the solar cells get, the more power it gets and it flies better and better. And it finally did the flight for which it was intended, Paris to the same Manston RAF base in England, 100 and about 163 miles at 11,000 feet, uh, and most of the flight at that altitude was about 40 miles an hour. So it 
did its job and became a was shown around at various exhibits and then became a museum piece like various of our other vehicles. Just the fact that you can fly on some power of sunbeams is uh, pretty remarkable. People think differently when they realize that. And uh, now I think it's a, a it's a catalyst for thinking and just gets people uh, to think a little more deeply and, and a little more openly about alternative energy options. Nothing is easy. <laughs> now, the solar plane, first we made the Gossamer Penguin, which was a leftover human-powered airplane from that cross-channel project, three-quarters the size of the Gossamer Albatross. And we put a panel, we happen to have just a small panel's worth of solar cells at the beginning of the project, and we put those on. We wanted to learn, uh, just get our hands dirty with uh, learning about the solar cells, how you glue them on, how you wire them up, the problems of heating, overheating the little electric motor, and so on. So we put this panel up over the top of the airplane, and we needed a this, they provided very little power, I forget, 400 watts or something total. And we needed a very lightweight pilot, so we used my son Marshall, who was only 13, as the pilot because he only weighed 80 pounds. And this plane was so different than a regular airplane that it didn't give you any special advantage to have regular airplane training. The training in skateboards and unicycles is uh, really good training for getting going in this. And he flew the plane very well adapted quickly and went through a lot of test flights, one very dramatic crash, but like all our crashes, the pilot wears a helmet, it's low and slow. It was up around 15 miles an hour in this case and uh, nobody got r really hurt any worse than you would in a small bicycle accident. And he did the first flight where any human has actually climbed on the power of sunbeams uh, as we got that plane going. And then, then for publicity purposes, we had to show it in a long flight for the media at Edwards Air Force Base that didn't seem interested in having a 13-year-old kid without a license out flying. The goal of the project really was media. That's what the money was being paid for. and. Uh, having to do special flights, spend extra weeks and so on on them, is not a distraction from our project. It is part of our project. And some of the engineers just want to do the airplane, but after a while they get to realize this is all part of the program. It's just as important as a better airfoil, uh, uh, handling the media aspects right. And part of the good of the program, uh, aside from helping the sponsor, is getting the word out on it so more people hear about it and begin understanding about solar cells and lightweight construction. Nothing fundamentally different in the Sun Racer really is a very aerodynamic sort of vehicle made with uh, uh, sort of airplane composite construction techniques and some lightweight, uh, very lightweight tubular structure and solar cells. Uh, were rather similar in electric motor and, and so on, but still it was for a different purpose, so you uh, did a very different design. The, that project started because General Motors thought it just might, when they heard about the solar car race across Australia, they just thought, hey, maybe this would be fun to enter because they'd recently acquired Hughes Aircraft that makes solar cells and is a high technology company. And they thought a challenge like this would help the outside world appreciate that they were high technology, GM and Hughes, and would be interesting challenge for their engineers. And they wanted to get back more into competition. And especially, they thought it would be good for education, that it would be a very appealing project. Uh, the vehicle would be of interest to youngsters, kind of like a, a dinosaur is, but would get people turned on to uh, engineering and science, so maybe more of the best and brightest would become scientists and engineers instead of lawyers and MBAs that maybe the world doesn't need more of.
So the educational aspects uh, were really very large in their mind. So they decided they wanted to do it, but didn't know really if they could. But we were able to get a lot of things all going in parallel uh, and, and have a very quick project because we knew the, the various aspects that had to go into the thing. And there's only eight months from the start of the project to the race, and we were able to handle it and even have 4,000 miles of testing on the car before it reached, uh, before it started the race, so as to uh, be sure of reliability. I don't think there's any reason to have solar-powered cars in the future. Uh, that car did have a small battery in it, but the it started with the battery filled and finished the project with the battery filled, but still it was able to use the battery when there were clouds in the late afternoon. If you have a battery-powered car, sure, it doesn't hurt to put on solar cells, you get a little help, but uh, a, a real solar-powered car doesn't make much of any sense. But this was a nice stepping stone toward it. Got a lot of people thinking about it, and certainly if there had not been the great success of the Sun Racer, there probably would not have been the Impact Car project, which now is just a battery-powered car with no uh, involvement with solar cells. If we're talking about the Impact Car that we sort of led the development team on for General Motors, it has a large, it's a small, jazzy-looking two-person car, but it's got about almost 900 pounds of battery in it, regular lead acid cells, but carefully tailored to the purposes of this vehicle. And in ordinary use, you would plug it into the wall socket when you get home at night, and the battery would be fully charged the next morning. But if you want to plug it into a higher power circuit, you can charge it much more quickly than that. Once charged, it, well, it's got the fast acceleration, zero to 60 in eight seconds, and we limit it electronically to 75 miles an hour, but we go way over 100 if you, if you wanted it to. We don't know any reason for it to. And the range in either the urban cycle or the highway cycle is sort of starts at 120 miles, but uh, the battery gets uh, a little worn down. You, you may not be able to get quite as much, and if you want to use the air conditioner a lot, then you uh, which it does have, then you won't go as far. But for most commuting tasks, that's enough to handle things. And the local power company could provide enough electricity at nighttime to charge up several million of these vehicles in the Los Angeles area without adding any capacity. Because it has to have the big capacity to handle everybody's air conditioners in the afternoon in the summer and then you don't use much of anything at night, and so they have a lot of electricity to charge those vehicles. But if you do a long trip uh, in the middle of the day while you're having lunch, you could recharge what you use then and you get a bit greater distance. In the long run, I think hybrid cars are gonna win out, which are like the electric impact to which you have added a little auxiliary power unit which somehow converts chemical energy gasoline, hydrogen, compressed natural gas, uh, propane, whatever, to electricity by a uh, uh, little reciprocating engine or a gas turbine or fuel cell or somehow. There are a lot of different candidate devices being looked at now. And so you can operate fully electric some of the time, but if you really want to go to Phoenix from Los Angeles, uh, if this is thing uses gasoline, you, you do generate your electricity on board, but you do it with great efficiency because the, the engine that's generating electricity only has to operate at one power setting, one RPM, and it can convert the fuel very efficiently to electricity in that one condition and do it with very low air pollution. But one of the big advantages is in city traffic where you're putting on the brakes all the time, you're just throwing away huge energy, but with an electric car you get that energy back because they use regenerative braking. Instead of heating the brake linings, you shove electricity back into the battery. Now, one big feature of the electric car is that a battery is such a poor source of energy compared to gasoline. You only get 1% as much energy out of a lead acid cell system as you get out of the same weight of 
gasoline. It's a hundred factor of a hundred hit you're taking. The only reason it works is because you make the vehicle superbly efficient. That's why it hasn't been done before. It took the concept of efficiency honed through the human-powered airplanes and, and the Sun Racer to get the efficiency that makes the impact feasible. Once you've done that, you can apply that efficiency to uh, other vehicles, the gasoline vehicles, and consume much less gasoline. Uh, or if you want to use compressed natural gas, which is awkward because you have to have a big tank, which is heavy, if you don't need much energy, now you get by in a little tank. It becomes much more convenient. So efficiency just has all sorts of advantages, making things feasible and cutting down pollution. Energy is one part of the whole problem of there are too many people and too much consumption and not enough earth. And we could get by with it in the past, but now everything's going up like that. You know, the population has tripled since I was born, and there's more uh, energy uh, materials per capita being used now, and species are being wiped out. Uh, some latest number I saw is uh, one every four minutes is disappearing because of man, and it's a very different ball game that we're facing. You can't extrapolate it from the past, and just anything that makes it so we can get along on this limited world is better, and doing more with less is part of it, and somehow getting off our energy jag or uh, uh, addiction is important. You can do so many things with so much less energy than we now use. Now, airplanes, regular airliners, especially the modern ones, are really designed brilliantly. They're made for efficiency. Nobody cares what they look like on the outside. They are made to do their job. The aerodynamics is elegant. The structure is elegant, and uh, they're really fine. Cars, on the other hand, are designed for a di very different purpose, and styling is important. Inexpensive mass production is important. Uh, a lot of safety operation by unskilled people, and they end up in a, and you like peppy performance. And it ends up when you do all that, they consume a lot of power, and there aren't any airplane aerodynamicists really designed or involved in their uh, design, although there are uh, good aerodynamicists mixed in with the stylus. But if you look at the underside of any car that does see the air just as much as the top side sees it, you realize how little attention is paid to smooth aerodynamics of cars. The biggest thing why we haven't done more with all sorts of alternative energies is the existing energies we have are so wonderful. Oil is so relatively inexpensive, uh, some, uh, not when you look at all its real cost, but uh, in some ways it is, and na natural gas is good, and nuclear power, uh, uh, plants you already have are relatively inexpensive, hydropower is uh, pretty good, and, but we don't really have more nuclear power. There are a lot of troubles with it. You can't get much more uh, hydropower, so those are limited, and coal uh, has a lot of troubles associated with it. But these are all somewhat inexpensive, and when you, uh, you know, all the economically viable alternatives were worked on for uh, economic reasons in the past. Now, when you try and find some new thing and see if you can, that uh, maybe doesn't have as much pollution or is replenishable, so you're never going to run out, you find it is not as cheap as these uh, others uh, that are uh, more limited in their future and have some negatives on pollution about them. So, un unfortunately, all the things people have tried are more expensive. Solar cells were very expensive and have steadily come down in price. And they, in the best of circumstances, they can almost compete with uh, certain of the uh, oh, oil burning power plants. And 
wind power is the same. It's been expensive. You know, we had subsidies uh, for it. In a while, gasoline is going to be very expensive. I don't know just when that while is, but it's a vanishing resource and its sources are tangled up with some very unfortunate uh, political uh, military problems, but uh, in the United States we're going to run out of our supply fairly soon. We're going to be completely dependent on others and it's going to be a very sticky thing and we're finally going to start recognizing the real costs of it, not just the cost to ship it here and put it in your car. So it's going to be expensive and we're not going to be using it in gasoline after a while. Certainly your grandchildren aren't going to be driving cars uh, using gasoline. What they're going to be using Flying airliners, I don't know, because uh, oil for airliners, uh, I don't know of a really practical substitute, but there are a lot of substitutes you can make for uh, surface transportation. Surface transportation is all mingled, uh, problems are all mingled with uh, traffic problems too. There are technological solutions to get by on less energy, to put out less pollution. I don't know the technological problems to handle the traffic which is, a, uh, you know, there are too many people and not enough world and traffic is a big problem. I think telecommunications are going to get much greater use as time goes on because travel is going, uh, in like the Los Angeles area, is just going to be so awkward. So that's one of the things that will grow. I recall that when I was 12 I wanted to be a doctor because my father was a doctor and you just assume that's what you're going to be but shortly after that having gotten very involved in model airplanes I found I was much more interested in aviation and figured I'd probably have something to do with aviation but r really didn't have a career, uh, detailed career goal in mind just it was becoming more obvious it would have to do with aviation and maybe physics uh, and engineering as time went on, but even when I was in graduate school I didn't really know what I was going to get into and what did happen then was very different than you could have predicted anyhow. I think back about early books, uh, read the various Oz stories, some myth, fable things. As a teenager I remember Jerry Todd stories, which is kind of like a humorous Tom Swift fair. There are a lot of big little books and some of them, uh, Flash Gordon and Tarzan, uh, probably things like that. And then as one got older, some more serious books and novels. And now, uh, well, all kinds of books and there are great magazines that come in in great profusion. You can't possibly keep up with all of them. Probably the book that really got me going into something more than anything else was Comstock, I think it was Comstock's Moth book, maybe as a butterfly book also, because I got just hugely involved, probably around the age of 10, in collecting butterflies and moths, and that became quite a, an addiction, and I sort of learned the scientific name of all the big butterflies and moths and did a lot of collecting. Uh, in that period your mind is pretty fertile and uh, if you have a hobby you can devote yourself rather wholeheartedly to it. And that was a pretty good one, coaxing you to read and be outside a lot and do a bunch of new things. So I do remember those books. The ones that were easiest I probably liked. And physics and math were easy because they just involved principles and they're kind of fun like games and just interesting uh, history and English were very difficult and uh, so I didn't enjoy them but I did pay a lot of attention to them because I figured if I'm not good at them I should work a little harder at them. As I look back I realize I probably had some manifestations that would be called dyslexia now not a basket case but uh, certainly a uh, in some things a short attention span. If I'd start reading a paragraph of history, by the time I was to the second sentence, my mind would be a thousand miles away. And even in, even in physics classes, I'd tend to daydream and about 
other things not get so much good out of class. And, and now I still notice, uh, well, you tend to uh, jump between subjects in my mind, think about a lot of different things, but also if I write down uh, 274, I say 274, I write down 274 and I look at it, I've written 254 because I'm still mixing up a few numbers. There's some misconnection between some part of the brain and another part of the motor system, but not enough to be at all troublesome, but it sure makes you realize if you had a bad case of that, how difficult it would be to get by in life. But having a brain that works a little differently than what best fits a school system, you learn to cope and you emphasize the things that uh, you, you sort of do it the way best suits you. I did most of my learning during the homework rather than the class period. Very envious of people who got it in class and therefore didn't have to spend the time on homework. But I think that means that you uh, can work on your own pretty well and has some benefits associated with it. Well, I think that people without dyslexia seem like oddballs to me because why, when we were evolving into Homo sapiens sapiens in the la sort of 100,000 years ago in the, say, the savannas of Africa, uh, why would the ability to look at little wiggly lines on a flat sheet and interpret sounds and messages from them and see the little details between the different squirrely cues, why would that have anything to do with survival? Whereas uh, other things that dyslexics may be pretty good at, uh, and the ability to uh, see, run, reason, fight the lion, whatever. Uh, I can understand how all those talents uh, provided survival and therefore evolutionary selection. But the ability to read, which is so much what our modern civilization is focused on, uh, until we all get to be TV addicts, I guess, uh, it seems sort of unnatural. And, but our whole school system and culture is built up around that, and uh, I think there may be a, a sort of impedance mismatch between that and what people really are. I think one thing was that in high school, I was always the smallest kid in the class by a good bit, and I was not especially coordinated, and certainly not the athlete type, though I enjoyed running around outside and was uh, socially uh, kind of immature, not the comfortable leader, teenager type. And so when I began getting into model airplanes and getting into contests and creating new things, I probably got more psychological benefit from that than I would have from some of the other typical school things, which I'm, I'm sure I would have preferred then. So without thinking about it, I probably uh, found the models more appealing. And of course, as I look back now, I'm delighted that I had this, uh, these defects or problems back then and got into models which led to a lot of other things that have been very exciting rather than just being the football jock that uh, I certainly would not be at this age. But I somehow got especially interested in a large variety of models. My father was very supportive in that help, but, but uh, he wasn't leading me, he was supporting. But I found myself instinctively drawn to working on ornithopters, autogyros, helicopters, indoor models, outdoor models, hand launch gliders, rubber power, gas power, uh, just big variety. And some of them were okay. I wasn't as good as some other modelers, but I don't think anybody had the breadth of experience in different kinds uh, that I had back then. There's something appealing about it. In a few cases, you'd get some records in some new category, which was fun. But uh, a lot of it was just plain enjoyable to do something that was new and different that hadn't been done before. I was in a 
culture, sort of schools that I went to, the various people that I was with, uh, that my family was involved with. Uh, you all worked hard, uh, reasonably so, had good life, but you, tr you tried to get good marks in school without knowing why you were trying to get good marks. It was just that's what everybody did. And you look back and you're sort of glad you paid that much attention to schooling, but it was just the culture of people who were doing things and sort of achieving. It was coming out of the Depression era and life was maybe a little simpler then. You're working hard to try and get someplace. So uh, I think starting with that was uh, quite comfortable and then I just from the uh, private high school that I went to, you know, sort of everybody who goes there almost automatically goes to Yale and then uh, and then that and then uh, I got good education at Caltech afterwards still not quite knowing what you're getting the education for is just part of that's what you do and, and then it was later that I uh, really began some of the doing so being in the right circumstance a bit privileged to be able to go to some of these things uh, was very helpful When you get into outdoor model airplane flying for duration, you get involved in thermals and long duration flights and you begin hearing a little bit about sailplanes. And I remember a newsreel in, let's say, 1938, uh, when I was 13 years old, that showed a sailplane flying over the slope at El Mirage, just this big, graceful machine flying along. It still sticks in my mind as an early memory. The newsreel also showed it crashed uh, a few minutes later, but uh, that didn't bother me. It was, uh, I, I think nobody was hurt. It was just such a, a wonderful kind of flying. That, and then I found when in Navy, in Navy pilot training down at Pensacola uh, with a lot of spare time watching the thunderstorms uh, grow up, and uh, I knew a few people who were involved in the sailplane field by then. It, it just, uh, you're picturing flights that sailplanes could make in such wonderful upcurrents, and then circumstance uh, through these friends permitted me to get involved actively in it after the war, and I found it just a wonderful, addicting hobby. It was a very scientific sort of hobby. It's not just like going out and rowing a boat. Uh, you get involved in the, the science of the vehicle because the vehicle has to be efficient and the science of meteorology because you have to learn uh, something about meteorology to figure out where the upcurrents are and how to make proper use of them. So it doesn't matter what your background is, you become a scientist of sorts if you get involved in active sailplaning. It's a very elegant hobby from that standpoint. And that particular hobby was good because I was able to fly in contests, which are a lot of fun, uh, sort of demanding, but I didn't do much flying in between times because it was very inconvenient. But then for a contest you could go and for a whole two weeks you go sometimes to a foreign country and really be very active, learn a lot about the country, meet a lot of people from all around the world and do the flying. It was a very, very special hobby from that standpoint. I don't think of myself as especially competitive and I sometimes wonder about competitions uh, and how they motivate people. don't have a lot of answers, but competitions are great things for coordinating uh, people's interests. It doesn't matter whether it's a money prize or just a trophy. People all get together and, and do compete and share and it may not matter who wins, though I find that if you're in a contest there's always some uh, motivation towards trying to win, but the real value is just uh, entering the competition. When I got into sailplanes, I'd already been doing aviation. I pictured sailplanes should be less expensive, don't burn any gasoline, 
and should be a lot more fun and should be safer. There are many fewer moving parts. There's no engine to go bad. You should be more in control of your own destiny than you are with typical airplane. In Navy pilot training, I was given very good principles of safety. They are very safety-minded, and you double-checked everything, and you're always uh, where if the engine went bad, you could still get down to a landing spot and things like that, and I carried over into the sailplane training. So I thought I was operating pretty safely, but you were operating with experimental aircraft, which are a little more risky than some, but I didn't do anything that I thought was dangerous because danger is not the least bit appealing. It's just dumb. You should avoid it. Still, when you're flying inside thunderstorms, you go to where some of the most vicious weather is, and you may be even in some hail storm, a hail generating part of a cloud, and huge up currents and down currents and big turbulence, you can get into things that are a bit more intense than you expected, and then you may have to land someplace in some giant wind and, and big wind shears. So uh, you get a proper respect for weather, and you try and be very careful, but still, by, in various competitions, I found that by making a series of very safe decisions, I still ended up in an unsafe place, and it didn't make me thrilled or excited, it just made me mad, resolving not to get in those circumstances again. The last flight I had in competition in the 1956 international contest in France that I won, uh, I got in circumstances where whether I survived or didn't just was the flip of the coin, whether the turbines went that way or that way, as I was down in a valley from which there was no way to get out with huge turbulence just buffing you know, like a little chip of wood in a frothing surf, and I didn't like that. And, uh, and also some of the flying, uh, uh, there are often many sailplanes all in the same thermal, people not watching out properly, and I found other people willing to take many more chances than I would, and two sailplanes would be willing to go in the same small cloud at the same time, things like that. that uh, I began figuring this really wasn't the sport for me. I mean, I did some dumber things after that, but never with the intention of them being dangerous. If you want to move mountains, you can just go move mountains. If you don't have a big enough shovel, you get some friends to help you. you uh, if you have the enthusiasm uh, to charge ahead, you can do all sorts of things. You know, you, some things you can't do. You can't invent a perpetual motion machine. You've you got to select your targets, but people can do so much more than they realize. Our education system, our parents, uh, circumstances, uh, I think you can get away from it fairly quickly by being put in circumstances where everybody else just doesn't even know the word problems, the challenges they understand, but things aren't uh, barriers. If there's a barrier or a stone wall, you walk around the end or you leap over it and you don't beat your head against it. So I think uh, it's not inherent in humans, uh, it's just the way we've gotten our system going. I've gotten a good bit into thinking skills and the teaching of thinking skills. Uh, thinking skills means many different things to people, but mostly it's an open way of perceiving the outside world and, and being much more open in what you're uh, doing, how you handle problems. But the exciting part of it is that you can hugely improve a person's thinking skill in just a few hours uh, because you haven't had it in school uh, before, but somebody teaches you a few little tricks that can become habits and you're a different thinker and it only took a few hours. As one thinks back over some uh, mentors, it wasn't uh, teachers in school who I'm sure did a good job, but I was not a, a, uh, oh, a responsive student, put it that way, and didn't interact with them a lot, but some things more on the outside that related to hobbies did uh, provide this. So in model airplaning, there's a national champion I got to know, and his good friend, who became my father-in-law eventually, 
and also as my entree to sail planing uh, was, uh, I think you, they were uh, to some extent mentors. And then another person, Dr. August Rasput in the sail plane business, just a wonderful scientist, so excited about what he was doing, eclectic, uh, dealing with all sorts of subjects. And when you spent time with him, it rubbed off. And then the final one was Irving Langmuir, a Nobel Prize winner in uh, physical chemistry, I guess, uh, who was one of the pioneers of weather modification and was very helpful to me in just following him around, interacting with him. Uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasms rubbed off and again the feeling of uh, there are no barriers, you just charge ahead. It doesn't matter whether you know anything about that subject, he'd plunge into a new subject and uh, ask lots of questions, make mistakes, and plot ahead and didn't worry him whether he was right or wrong as long as he was building up something towards something worthwhile. So he was helpful. I'm lucky I've been able to move from one field to another and I find when you're in some subject five years or ten years at the right stage that can be really exciting when some things are getting going but when you've got full-time people working with great skill at some details of it doing so much better than you possibly could. You somehow find you're off into some other field and the breadth uh, going from one field to another is very useful but the world needs all kinds. They sure need the specialists to do uh, very elegant things in some narrower field but especially as things are changing and evolving so quickly now in all fields, science, but uh, you know, philosophy, history, and everything else. Uh, ambling around from one field to another, I think, is especially important, and I'm luck sort of lucky that I've been able to do that. And it's kind of comfortable because when you get into a new field, you don't have some position to protect. You can ask any dumb question and, and learn an awful lot. And sometimes you bring something a little different to that field than the people who are already in it, so you can make some contribution. If you charge around, do a lot of things, you have more opportunity for luck. In the sort of things I'm doing, you do find the help of various people is very critical to what goes on. So uh, you don't stand proudly and say, I did all this. It's uh, many other people who uh, helped you along the way that uh, is a key element. Uh, but if you figure out exactly what you're going to do and just go doggedly at that for three decades, you're going to miss a lot of boats. Uh, the way the world is going now, change is so rapid. What is important is evolving so quickly that uh, I think you better uh, jump into new opportunities and new challenges. may not do you as well economically, uh, but I think it's important. It was very awkward for people who were good students, went into the aerospace industry because that was the best job offer for the engineer, the aerodynamicist, and they get more specialized and they get salary rapidly going up, very high salary with all the military industrial complex procurements. And the person would get narrower and narrower and more specialized and end up sort of uh, useless for the world, unfortunately. And, and then if suddenly there's a big cutback, this person, this salary up here, uh, couldn't even get a salary down here because they weren't that useful for anything else. So, uh, no, I'm not against narrowness. Some of the very best things happen uh, with people who are real specialists, but uh, I think there's more virtue in adaptability now because the world is changing so fast and has so many aspects to it. It is not the simpler world it was back 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Whatever you've been trained in, uh, it's the wrong field for the most exciting, important subjects of 20 years from now. So adaptability, I think, is very desirable. But, but uh, when you go to school, 
uh, it is great to develop some skills and learn fundamentals and develop approaches to things. Those are common to anything you get into. And there's a lot of very good training that engineers and scientists get. They deal with reality and tend to be creative and have to figure out goals and solve problems. And I think they sometimes, when they get into art or history or philosophy uh, at some later time, may bring some talents to those fields that the people who go through the ordinary training uh, aren't as good at. I picture that everybody is creative and when you're in the uh, playpen fiddling around with all sorts of things you're creative and certainly in the sandbox you're creative and playing around with toys or the boxes the toys come in which often offer more creativity. Uh, everybody is and the way you're interacting with people and you're very creative the way you manipulate two adults when you're a youngster and you can figure out just how far to push them and so on. But then somehow you get into school, into the more standard parts of culture, and so much of this erodes with most people. But really, everybody is creative and put in the right circumstances, uh, even if they haven't been what you'd call creative. I think they, get, they can probably, uh, the, the creativity can be fanned into flame. I'd probably go into education, which uh, I wouldn't have said years ago, but there's just such huge things you can do in education uh, because so much is done so poorly, not because there aren't dedicated people, but just a lot of new ideas are emerging and they're hard to inf in inject into an, a system with a lot of inertia. And right now, teachers don't get much respect and much money. I think that's going to change as they get recognized as being so important and it's a very satisfying uh, job. So I, I think teaching, especially of youngsters, second grade, seventh grade, fifth grade, uh, around that is of absolute tremendous importance. These are sort of the brightest minds. They haven't been beaten down by nar being narrowed and they're open to all sorts of things. And if you can help the opening process, that's very good. The other subject to get into it deals with the most potent uh, thing, weapon, whatever you want to call it, in the world, which is the human mind. And uh, I'm thinking more of the, you might call the adult mind, which is getting mingled with technology now and how one gets this all together, I don't know. There, there's nothing more important, you know, soon in your computer terminal you'll be able to access essentially any any book, any drawing, anything around the world. You'll be able through telecommunications to sort of talk to anybody, any place. You'll be able to talk their language through little translators to anybody, any place. You know, it's just beyond comprehension of people around now and you may be able to uh, couple your brain to computer, not by voice sound or punching buttons, but by things implanted in your brain. It's conceivable. And even the definition of what's a human was going to get more fuzzy. Computers are now uh, sort of insidiously taking over and becoming more our masters than our servants, more than we realize. And I happen to think that the surviving intelligent life form on Earth is going to be carbon-based, not silicon. I mean, going to be silicon-based, not carbon-based, but uh, and more people are agreeing with me. Computers are going to take over. They're going to be brighter than people in the not too distant future. We'll be pets for a while, and then after that, I don't know. Man has basically won the war against nature. Unfortunately, that's the bad news. Uh, you wish he hadn't. Man. If you look at, if, if you are a galactic explorer, come from some distant uh, galaxy and looked in on the Earth and tried to write it up and characterize what are humans, what are they like, uh, the easiest analogy that you get is a cancer. A cancer 
just grows like that from the standpoint of the cancer, it's great. More cancer cells all the time from the standpoint of the other cells that they're crowding out. It's the pits, and of course, after a while, they kill their host, which is bad for the cancer cells as well as the other cells. And that's what we're on the road to. Man has become God. You used to think, you know, you're just this little thing and there are circumstances and uh, lightning in the big world and whatever. Now you can control things. You can wipe out all the other species uh, and you may be doing it anyhow, uh, but it's, it's up to you and you can do genetic engineering. You can create new species and uh, just do things that were beyond comprehension before and turn the world into whatever you want and I don't think humans have the brains, the wisdom to be very good at this because that's not the way they were brought up. They've got all these huge tools but they're like uh, a two-year-old with a 45 automatic <coughs> and doesn't know what to do with it and what you'd like is to not have as <laughs> many automatics around and get that two-year-old a little brighter. I'm, I alternate between pessimism and optimism. I found the best pessimism summary comes from the great philosopher Woody Allen who said that civilization is at a crossroads. One road leads to misery and devastation, the other to total destruction. We must choose wisely. And there's a lot more to that statement than you might think.